Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we'll be discussing pinworm, an infection caused by Enterobius vermicularis. You'll notice I said it's an infection rather than a disease. And as we'll see, this is the most benign foreigner that we can think of that occupies our large intestine. This is often classified as a parasite, but it's a great example of how to begin the discussion of nematode infections in humans. To begin with, pinworm is found everywhere. So virtually every human being is susceptible to the infection, and it's a childhood infection that begins in preschool, perhaps, but certainly after the child enters, a, let's say, a daycare center or kindergarten or first grade. By that time, they've probably encountered the infection and become infected, and as they progress through their own life and achieve puberty, as we will see, the pinworm uh, susceptibility factor goes down. So rarely is this an, an infection of adults. It's primarily an infection of children. The history of discovery was quite simple. It's a worm that you can actually see with your naked eye. It's about this big, <laughs> maybe a half a centimeter to a centimeter in length, depending on whether it's a male or female worm. And Bremser was the first to observe this. And of course, the ubiquitous Linnaeus uh, applied the name, uh, the moniker, uh, Enterobius vermicularis, which has stayed to this day. It's actually an elegant looking worm. It's got all of the parts that uh, Cenorhabditis elegans has. Uh, in fact, there's very little difference in this parasite as compared to the free living adult of Cenorhabditis. But let's just discuss it in general again. It's tube shaped and fusiform. So you see the head over here is blunted, but the tail is a sharp ending little portion of its cuticle, hence the common name for it, pinworm. That's the part that they named this worm after, not knowing which end was which to begin with. It contains muscle, contains a cuticle which protects it from the elements of the outside world, namely our large intestine where this worm lives. The ovaries are shown here, and the production of eggs occurs there as well. And way up in the head end of this worm, and it's typical for all nematodes, we see the, the oral cavity, and then it leads to this bulbous muscular esophagus. And uh, the parasite, well, if you want to call it a parasite, well, it's questionable as to whether this is a parasite or just a traveler in our gut tract. The food of this worm is the bacteria that comprises our fecal material. And it digests that material and converts it to metabolites, which it then reinstitutes into its ovaries to constitute eggs, and if it's a male, of course, sperm. Very simple design, elegant, and highly successful. One of the most successful invaders of the human condition I can think of. Life cycle is very straightforward and is considered a direct life cycle. So nematode life cycles will be divided into direct and indirect. So in this case, it's direct. <clears throat> we can begin with a sleeping child. Thumb sucking is, is quite regular in terms of a habit. And pica is another habit. That means the placing of inanimate objects in their mouth just to get a feel for your environment as you're growing up. However, it has some uh, drawbacks, and one of them is the fact that the eggs of this parasite are in the environment of the child, especially if there are other children in the environment with them, other siblings that may harbor this infection. The eggs are then ingested, they hatch in the small intestine, and then are passively carried to the transverse section of the large intestine, where they mature into adult males and females. The worms then mate. The females are now heavy with eggs. They're gravid, as the term is applied to the nematodes. And within six weeks, this worm then migrates out of the anus onto the perianum. And she does one of two things at this point. She either dies and disintegrates and releases the eggs, or she suffers from a prolapse of her uterus, which expels the eggs, not just to the perianum of that particular infected individual, but if this child is sleeping without covers, without clothes, as so many children do in the tropics and subtropics, the eggs have a, 
an opportunity to become airborne as well. The eggs are among the fastest developing of all of the invertebrates from the time it's an egg that's not embryonated to the time it's infectious is a mere six hours. So within that time, inside the egg, the fertilized egg undergoes morphogenesis to develop into an infectious larva. So in, within six hours, these eggs are now infectious, not only for the same person, but for other people in their environment. So that's the life cycle of pinworm. Every six weeks, every six weeks, the infections in some cases can become synchronous. As a result, the released products of dying worms on the perianum can lead to secondary infections because there is an allergic response to those secretions and uh, byproducts of its metabolism. And the, the patient, in this case a small child, senses that as an itch and begins to scratch, not only contaminating their fingernails with the eggs, but also perhaps damaging tissue and allowing bacteria into their uh, area as well as we'll see in a minute. When we discuss the cellular and molecular pathogenesis of pinworm, we've got very little to discuss because actually in most, 99.9% .9 of the cases of infections, there's no disease. So the worm itself is not capable of causing disease. It's the secondary effects of the worm either migrating into aberrant locations throughout the body, and in this case, mostly in females, or the secondary infections induced by the itching of the response to the released products of dying worms. That's the pathogenesis of pinworm, but for the most part, it's benign. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. This is a young woman who has young children. She reports that her son, who is about 10 years old, has been having some discomfort and itchiness in his anal area. She reports that she has looked at the area and does not see anything abnormal. She reports no complaints from her husband or other children, it's just two other children. Um, but she now has a feeling that something is not right in her anal area and she reports it feels irritated. She uh, reports no recent travel, but did have a visit from her sister and her sister's three young children about three months ago. She does have a dog. She does lots of volunteer um, work with exposure to children, um, doing this mainly at a local church. So let's talk about clinical disease. The majority of infected individuals are actually free of symptoms. Those few who are symptomatic um, can often experience uh, itching, even intense itching of the perianal area. Now, it's important to understand the entire cycle, as Dr. De Pommier has presented. The entire cycle is completed within four to six weeks after the ingestion of the infectious egg. Um, sometimes aberrant vaginal infection can lead to vaginal itching, so we can actually have the, uh, the pinworm move into the vaginal area, sometimes even leading to serous discharge. Patients who experience abdominal pain during infection may do so because there's something else going on. Um, we usually don't think of uh, this pathogen as causing abdominal pain. Now, we can see eosinophilic enteritis caused by E. vermicularis. Uh, this can be hemorrhagic and can present with abdominal pain and melanoma. So in some cases, we can see an association. This is a heavy infection of enterobius vermicularis. You can see this image here of this um, anus with uh, the females. Now what about diagnosis? Now visualization of the worms or eggs um, is really the most common way this is diagnosed. The infection is usually diagnosed by actually visualizing these. But there's a little bit of a challenge. This isn't, this isn't a time when you order the ova and parasites. Since the eggs are deposited on the perianal skin and not released into feces, stool examination for ova and parasites is of little utility in diagnosing this infection. Eggs are best obtained by harvesting from the perianal area using clear, not a frosted adhesive tape, or these commercially available adhesive pinworm paddles. Um, the adhesive tape or paddle should be applied to the perianal region in the early hours of the morning or as the patient sleeps or as soon as the patient awakes before a bath or any kind of bowel movement. The taper paddle is then looked at under light microscopy. And these female worms are, are really small. They're about a centimeter long. They're very thin, um, but they can be visualized even without a microscope. They look like small, mobile, motile pieces of white thread. Um, serological testing is um, not really used clinically. Um, 
And as mentioned, if something else is going on, abdominal pain, you may want to look for other things. So often we're doing other tests not to diagnose this, but to rule out secondary complaints. Here are some images of the eggs of Anaerobia spermicularis. Uh, here's an unembryonated and here's an embryonated egg with the larvae. Uh, here is Enterobia spermicularis in the appendix, sort of cross sections as you're seeing of the, uh, of the organism. These are eggs found on microscopic examination of the clear sticky tape. Now, what about treatment? Now, th this is important because um, I often run into people that have spent $100 trying to treat this or $300 trying to treat this. Now, parental palmoate in a single dose or albendazole or mebendazole, again, expensive in the United States, really inexpensive in other parts of the world, um, can be given. But you want to give a second dose about two to three weeks after the first dose. Um, otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to end up getting reinfected. Now, I'll just say this again to reinforce in the United States, parental palmoate is an inexpensive and effective over-the-counter option, um, while some of these alternative medications can end up costing hundreds of dollars. Now, none of these drugs kill the eggs or developing larvae. Therefore, blind retreatment, as suggested, is recommended about two to three weeks after the original um, therapy. So the second round is going to destroy the worms that have hatched from those eggs that were ingested after the first treatment. But you're going to be treating them, killing them, before they're old enough to produce the next batch of eggs. So knowing the entire cycle lasts about four to six weeks, knowing that the eggs can survive for two to three weeks on clothing helps with understanding how you might have gotten exposed and how to best treat this. Now, treatment of exposed contacts, all household members and source patients um, is usually recommended. Uh, remember, these eggs can survive for two to three weeks on clothing, inanimate objects, which is why we're going to go ahead and recommend a retreatment about three weeks later, two to three weeks later, um, for effective cure. When we do that, um, we're getting close to 100% um, efficacy. But again, uh, this is quite an ubiquitous disease, so uh, people can often be reinfected again in the future. Now, what about our patient's outcome? Now, our patient a small one centimeter in length modal thread like worm was actually seen. This was identified as Anaerobius vermicularis or pinworm. Uh, an initial um, treatment with parental palmoate was given initially, and then two weeks or so, uh, this was repeated. All members of the household underwent the same therapy, and the patient um, had resolution of her symptoms, as did her son. Prevention and control of this infection among children is often difficult because this child probably picked it up from another child, not just in their own household, but perhaps at a daycare center or in a play yard or in any, any number of other places where these eggs, although in some cases are short-lived, in other cases because of the humidity and because of the temperature it can live for as much as six weeks out of the, the patient. So these children are constantly being exposed to the infection during school days. The summertime would be a time when the incidence rate for pinworm infection in small children would be down because they're not aggregating like they do when they get to school. But again, in the fall, throughout the winter months, in most temperate zone places, uh, pinworm infection is a seasonal thing. It has to be deal dealt with as such. And uh, in fact, the patient is often the parent rather than the child because the parent is very upset over the fact that they have been told that their child has an infection, and it's a nematode infection, it's a parasite. How could we possibly have a child infected with a parasite? We keep a very clean house, we make sure that our water is clean, our food is safe. Where do these parasites come from? And the pediatrician often spends more time explaining this to the parents and trying to reassure them that this is a normal uh, rite of passage, so to speak, for being a human being. And to deal with the symptoms rather than the infection itself. So if it becomes a heavy infection, of course, treatment is recommended. But if the infections are light, uh, perhaps other things are more important to deal with, and that's it, and then that's the case. If you want to learn more about uh, aberrant infections and pinworm, here's a good reference that we've selected for your reading pleasure. And of course, we've got two TWIP episodes as well, 19 and 87, in which we've discussed various aspects of pinworm infection. And you can get that on microbe.tv slash twip. 
So next time, we're going to discuss whipworm, or Trichurus trichura. Thanks for listening.